Our next panel, we're really switching gears. We're going to focus the next two panels on our young leaders. The next panel is Reaching Gen Z and Winning the Culture War. We have a representative from Turning Point USA, from Young Americans Against Socialism, and a former star of The Bachelorette. So this is going to be fun. Um, moderating this panel is Patrice Onwuka. You met Patrice last night. Uh, she awarded the Blankley Fellowship. Uh, Patrice is uh, director of the Center for Economic Opportunity with Independent Women's Forum. We awarded her the Tony Blankley Fellowship last year. She's doing some great work. I hope you've been reading and following all of her work and, and seeing her TV appearances. Um, I believe we have the, the stage all set right now, so let's welcome our panel. Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing right now? Are you guys dead or are you still here with us? <laughs> All right, there we go. So I'm excited to be moderating the Young Generation panel, Reaching Gen Z and Winning the Culture War. I'm Patrice Nwuka, as uh, you have just heard, and I'm really excited because we're going to explore how we can reach the next generation, win this culture war, by actually talking to people who are on the front lines every day. Uh, so I think we heard from Secretary Pompeo last night that the loss of our education system is one of the huge, big threats to the future of our nation. Uh, we're losing our young people to this radical, Marxist, sinister agenda. But we've got three impressive young people who are doing their part to fight back. So let's get a couple things straight first off. Uh, and I'm out of breath because I'm an East Coast girl, <laughs> and this mountain weather is a little bit unique for me. But in any case, uh, we're, when we talk about young people, we're actually now talking about two different generations. Let me make sure that my mic is, you guys can hear me. You guys know the millennials. Entitled, selfish, we're the ones, we're the, the kids of baby boomers and maybe Gen Xers. Uh, we were born between 1981 and about 1995. We are the cause of uh, avocado toast going viral. Uh, we are the ones who left college and came back to your basements to live there for quite a long time. Uh, but thankfully, as a millennial, as the, at the very beginning, I can say we are now moving out. We are buying properties, buying our first homes. Uh, we are having kids. I've got two. I know I'm killing the climate as a result. I actually have three. I'm killing the climate, but we're, we're hitting those generational milestones maybe a little bit later than some of our previous generations. But what we're going to focus on today is actually Gen Z. These are the younger folks. So they were born after 1996. About one in 10 of them were eligible to vote last year. We're talking about millions of folks in this generation. Show of hands, who's a Gen Xer? Who, sorry, who's a Gen Zer? All right, here we go. And then I got you right here, millennials right we're here. Together. <laughs> we're together. So five interesting things about Gen Z just before we get into our discussion today. Number one, they are the most racially and ethnically diverse generation in history. And, and millennials, we actually had that title previously, so that tells you something. Number two, they are on track to be the most well-educated generation. Uh, <clears throat> socialism indoctrination, Marxism indoctrination on campus. Number three, they are digital natives who have little or no memory of a world before the smartphone. Now, now let me just clarify. We millennials, we actually typed our papers on typewriters. I remember I had one at home, and we used whiteout when we made errors. This generation, they don't even know ex life before this. I mean, pre-internet, pre-computer, pre-laptop. So that when, we, when we talk about digital natives, this is what they know about technology. So this is really interesting. Obviously, they know about the other stuff, too. And then number four, this is important for the business owners. They are less likely to be working and then previous generations in their teens and their 20s. So they're not doing their summer jobs like we did. We used to cut grass. We used to you know, go out and find a job. I, was a, I worked at a library putting codes on, on books one summer. They're not doing that. You know what they're doing? Educational pursuits. Ah, college, you know, to, to beef up their resume for college. Again, 
that factory into the socialist Marxist indoctrination camp. And then number five, Gen Z Republicans, so these, these are bread and butter kids, are much more likely than older generation of GOPers to desire, listen to this, increased government role in solving problems. So this generation, our Republican Gen Zers think that there's a greater role for government, which is why what we do here at the Steamboat Institute is critical for educating this generation on why limited government and less government is the key for their success. So we've got some work to do. We've got some work to do in two camps. Number one, it, among those who should philosophically already be aligned, who are on, working on campus and they're college Republicans, maybe they grew up in a Republican household, and then we got to reach beyond those folks to those who don't care, like they're just on Instagram or TikTok doing videos all day. So how do we reach these two groups? So that's where we're going to get started and we are going to get going. So what I've asked is that each of these uh, stellar young people answer this big picture question. How do we win the culture war and what am I specifically doing to do so? All right, let's get started, Morgan. Morgan? All right. <laughs> Sorry. We're <laughs> no, good. it's fine. Uh, hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, thank you to Steamboat, and thanks, Patrice. I'm from upstate New York. My name is Morgan Zeggers, and so I feel a little homey being in Colorado. It's very similar, but there are some differences. Uh, I'm from upstate New York. I'm from a military family. My dad's still a colonel uh, in the U.S. Army, and I'm very thankful for that. And so his service qualified me to join the VFW Ladies Auxiliary when I was in high school. And I don't know why I did this one day, but I walked into the VFW and it was a bar and it was like 2 p.m. on a, a Tuesday. And I was so confused as to what the heck is going on here. And I joined the Ladies Auxiliary right away, became an officer, and that's how I got involved in my community. So I'm a big advocate in being a community leader and in being, being involved in the community instead of just saying, I'm gonna be president one day and I'm going to get involved in the political industry that is politics in 2021. So whenever I have young people reach out, I don't know if you guys have this, they're like, how can I become a political influencer? I say, go to the Rotary Club or go to the VFW or join your local GOP committee. That's my first suggestion. Uh, but because I'm a colonel's daughter who served in Operation Iraqi Freedom and on 9-11, I have certain values, right? And you would think that me, my little self, if I met a communist, I would know what to say when I met one. And unfortunately, I went to American University in Washington, D.C., and it's 90% liberal there. It's the number one most politically active campus in the country. So it was a little different from my rural town in upstate New York where there's more cows than people in the population. And my roommate there, I moved in and we're talking and I'm looking on her wall, I was getting distracted by something. And it was because it was a poster of Mao Zedong, Lenin, Stalin, Karl Marx, and Fidel Castro. Oh wow. Right. Uh. It said, welcome to the party. And they had these party hats on and these fruity cocktail umbrella drinks. And I just didn't know what to say because I'd seen those guys before in black and white pictures in my history textbooks a few years ago, but I didn't exactly know enough about them to say, what is that on your wall? So instead I just said, ha, hey, what's that? And she looked at me and she said, oh, I'm a communist. A self-identifying communist, not even just like, oh, I'm a social justice warrior or something like that. And so my entire time in college, I was more ostracized for being a basic conservative who believes in capitalism and personal freedom, economic freedom, than she was for being a communist with mass murderers and dictators on her wall. And so my interactions with that roommate who had mass murderers and dictators on her wall but was promising me progress and said she was going to uplift the working class of America and bring social justice and bring equality to the country I had no idea what to say to her, okay? I had no idea, and it was so disappointing for me. And so I went on a personal journey to educate myself and become a better person who'd be more well-equipped for conversations like that. And at that same time, as I graduated from college, numbers started to come out, and I'm sure you guys have all seen them. 70% of young Americans would currently vote for a socialist. 56% want socialism over capitalism. 58% would rather have a more socialist society over capitalism. The numbers are kind of crazy, right? And as I'm seeing this, I realize so many young people are going to continue to be put in my place where we're going to be hearing promises of progress from people who believe in the ideas of mass murderers and dictators from the 20th century. So I want them to be more prepared for those conversations. And when we talk about fighting back, 
I decided to start a nonprofit called Young Americans Against Socialism. We started by interviewing survivors from socialist and communist countries. Because I think anybody, even my roommate, hearing the stories of people who sacrificed so much and lost so much and then tried to risk their lives to make it to America's shores for freedom, it, it changes hearts. And so that's what we started to do. Now we're expanding though, and so I might even change the name. We're expanding to make sure everybody's equipped not only to talk about socialism, but to talk about many other aspects because I really do believe in the fight of the culture wars. Mm -hmm. Freedom is a lifestyle, and we need to get people ready and willing to live out that lifestyle of freedom. So I'm gonna keep expanding on that, and I'm just so excited to talk more about it with you guys. Love that. Thanks. Go for it, Jared. So my name's uh, Garrett Powell. I'm a golf professional by trade, but um, I was on season 15 of The Bachelorette. I like to say that I'm only known for getting dumped on TV. <laughs> oh. um, but if you don't know about the show like I didn't know, uh, it's a very far left-leaning fan base. And up until really after my season, no one, everyone was kind of scared to come out and say, hey, this is what I believe in. You know, I voted for Trump. I believe in the conservative values. And there came a point, and just after a show like that, you get very just rushed with, you know, fans, followers. You know, I'm, again, I'm from Alabama, didn't know about any of this stuff, so I didn't know what to expect. Um, but over time, you kind of ask yourself, okay, what is my role and what is, what is my purpose? I have this platform. Am I going to do good with it or am I just going like, to squander it? And so I almost, I started posting more conservative-based stuff and I realized that I was getting a lot of messages from fans and followers saying, thank you so much for speaking out about this. Thank you, I feel like I can't say this at my workplace or at school and I feel like I'm kind of alone. And so then that really inspired me to say, okay, let, let's not, let's quit chasing this like fame game and let's chase who Garrett is, what he believes in, because you never know who could inspire. So I hopped on with Turning Point USA and PragerU, and thankfully Steamboat, thank you guys for having me here. Um, and so my goal and my firm belief is that let's encourage Gen Zers or young people in general to have an open mind, to have a discussion that's okay to feel differently and have a discussion about a topic, but also let's research the thing that we believe in. So after leaving the show, I could tell you, yeah, I'm a conservative, couldn't fully tell you why. And so I, was, I got challenged by a lot of people, and a lot of people on the internet, as you know, you know, when you can say something through a screen, there's no repercussions from that, so you get <laughs> comments left and right. Um, but it challenged me as an individual to really look up, why am I a conservative? What do I fully believe in? And so that gave me confidence. And so whenever someone did challenge me on my beliefs, I was confident in it, and I can have a discussion with it. And I believe that is something young people nowadays just don't understand is that they read a headline and they say that must be true, but have no depth as to why it could be true. And so I'm using my platform to try to speak for conservative beliefs and to tell young people, hey, let's research it and it's okay to feel differently even if we don't believe the same thing, right? Awesome. All right, Isabel. All right. Hello everyone, my name is Isabel Brown and I am from the great state of Colorado so I'm so happy to be coming home this weekend and entertaining all of you with some crazy stories of Generation Z which believe me there's no shortage of those from the people sitting up here on this panel. I am a spokesperson for Turning Point USA, the world's largest youth-based conservative organization from a grassroots perspective. I'm an author of an Amazon best-selling book called Front Lines, Finding My Voice on an American College Campus, and I frequently contribute to various media programs, most often Newsmax, where you'll probably recognize me from several programs. I'm on almost every single day, so love Newsmax. They're a great, great channel to work with every day. Uh, I am also a former intern for the United States Senate for our great Senator Cory Gardner when he was in office. Miss him very much and a former intern for the White House under President Trump. I worked there in 2018 in the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. But if you had asked me a few years ago if I would be sitting here today telling you all our story and why Generation Z is so critical, not just for the political future of America, but for the future culture of our nation and the free world as we know it, 
I would have thought you were crazy. I never intended on working in politics or communications as a spokesperson for any major political organization. My dream was actually to pursue my first love, which was science. I loved the idea of pursuing objective truth, of understanding what we know can be proven and what we know is false, what is scientific concrete fact and what is fantasy. So I actually attended Colorado State University with the hopes of becoming a trauma surgeon and pursued my degree in biomedical sciences. I graduated in 2019 and later got a master's degree in biomedical sciences policy and advocacy from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., graduating last year. I was shocked at the large cowboy agricultural school up the road that many of you likely attended and cheer for for football games on Saturdays was pushing such an extreme leftist indoctrination narrative, not in political science or ethnic studies or gender studies, where we expect many of these conversations to be happening, but in biomedical sciences, in my classes like anatomy and physiology and organic chemistry. Instead of talking about what we knew was reality and what we knew was fantasy, I was being taught by my professors that yes, there's only two sets of chromosomes and you should memorize that for your test on Friday, but forget all about the notion of two genders. There's actually infinity options. You can just identify as whatever you want on a day-to-day -day basis. We spent months learning about every tiny thing that has to happen in the womb during fetal development for a baby to even make it to nine months of pregnancy, only to be told later on that abortion was not ending a genetically unique human life. It was just a medical procedure that likely was helping out the future of the mother. In my exercise science class, which was supposed to be talking about public health policy, not partisan politics, my professor opened the entire semester of the class in the first 20 minutes saying these words, and I quote, President Trump is a dipshit and the worst president we've ever had when it comes to public health. <laughs> Obama was better, not perfect, but better. And he went on to say to a class full of college students eager to learn anything they could from the expert in the room, I guess that's just the difference between Democrats and Republicans. Democrats care about everyone, and Republicans only care about some people. <laughs> Heads nodded around the room, notes are being taken to mm -hmm. memorize this for the test, and this was the encompassing spirit of almost every single class that I sat in at Colorado State University getting my degree in biomedical sciences, not political sciences, uh, there in Fort Collins over the last four years of my college experience. None of that was a reality until the day after the 2016 presidential election. Conversations about politics or who you were voting for or white supremacy at our border wall and why our mean tweet president was so terrible for this country never happened until he was elected into office, at which point I walked into my first class of the day and my professor showed up 25 minutes late wearing head to toe all black and a black lace veil draped over her face, bawling her eyes out, uncontrollably sobbing. She said, in English, I might add, for a Spanish class that I was paying tuition for, I'll never get that money or that time back in my life, said in English, we're going to be canceling the curriculum for the rest of the day, maybe the rest of the week or the semester. You don't have to take your final exams. There's free counseling resources available to you. I'm telling you all of this, and I'm so devastated because my generation did this to you. My generation did this to you. It was beyond fathomable belief for my professor to even remotely think that at the time a 19-year-old could have possibly voted for the orange guy or wanted a strong border wall or believed in freedom of speech and limited government. I actually started to chuckle like many of you at the beginning of this exchange, but I stopped laughing when I looked around the room and every single other student sitting around me was either somberly nodding their head in almost robotic fashion, hmm. taking in everything my professor was saying or crying their eyes out themselves. They were so distraught that a white supremacist was now taking over our political reality and therefore our culture in the United States that they truly believed they would be unsuccessful for the rest of their lives, that maybe they'd lose their lives, they were in constant physical danger on campus, you name it. So all of this inspired me to get involved in the process. I've never been one to sit back quietly and accept things the way they are under the status quo. I loved participating in speech and debate in high school and student government, and I wanted to be part of the solution on my college campus, but didn't see anybody else standing up for freedom of speech, for limited government, for even just intellectual diversity whatsoever on my federally funded land-grant institution, public college campus. 
And around the time that I decided I needed to do something about this, I was being incredibly targeted in student government as a white supremacist, a homophobe, transphobic, anti-woman, which makes a lot of sense that men were telling me I was anti-woman. I thought no uterus, no opinion, but I digress. The mental gymnastics <laughs> of the left are very complicated to keep up with. And around that time, got a targeted Facebook ad for a conference called the Young Women's Leadership Summit with Turning Point USA. I see a couple of nodding heads in the audience. Tailored towards high school and college young conservative women to learn about the facts that we don't need the government to succeed, that you don't have to be a leftist just because of your biology. And the most empowering and truly feminist thing you can do for yourself is to embrace your own destiny, to work hard, to realize your American dream. So something in me, I believe it was God, told me I had to attend this conference. And ever since, I have been head over heels in love with Turning Point USA, working with them from a daily basis. I started a chapter at my university at CSU, which quickly became the largest club on campus with hundreds of people involved. Wow. Uh, we hosted Charlie Kirk, Candace Owens, and Dennis Prager to campus, bringing in thousands of attendees. And I fell in love with the idea of advocacy and activism. As so many students, as Garrett mentioned, would approach me, or even teachers and professors, very quietly under their breath saying, thank you for what you're doing. I could never say this, and you have no idea who I am. But I know who you are, and I know what this organization is all about. And I'm so happy to know that I have a home here at the university I've taught at for 20 years. Or I'm a senior, and I've never, ever met someone who believes the same things that I do. Thank you for starting this community and this home on campus. Uh, because I fell so in love with Turning Point USA, after college, I decided to transition more into the public speaking and social media side of things. So I worked with PragerU for about a year after graduation, creating some pretty very fun content with them when it comes to Generation Z and college campus advocacy online from the digital perspective. I moved to Washington, D.C. and attended graduate school and started my position with Turning Point USA as a spokesperson for all of our chapters across the country in February of 2020. And things have taken off ever since. We are all part now of the Turning Point USA community in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but I can tell you, the numbers may seem bleak. It may seem overwhelming to think that the left has such a powerful narrative when it comes to infiltrating the classroom. We're now seeing that trickle down outside of college campuses to high schools, middle schools, even kindergartners and babies reading books like Anti-Racist Baby. Yes, that's a real book. It's an Amazon bestseller. And the Gay BCs, also a real picture book that we are reading to babies now in American culture. But I can tell you, Generation Z is different. When we think about the youth, we think about millennials, no offense to our millennials up here on this panel, as whining, crybaby, self-centered, entitled, blue-haired, screaming leftists, right? That's what we think of. It's the immediate thought that comes to mind. I think of the construction vest girl, the day after the 2016 election, she falls to her knees. No, I'm sure you've all seen the meme. Mm. It's fantastic. That's what we think of when we think of young Americans. But the reality is, every national poll and survey conducted on Generation Z, born in 1996 or 7, depending on who you ask, and younger, is the most conservative generation America has seen since World War II. That is yeah. news to celebrate. Only one in 10 of us can vote so far, so I think that's still to be proven when it comes to voter demographics. But groups like Turning Point USA, PragerU, having this conversation at the Steamboat Institute, we're understanding, as Andrew Breitbart is famous for saying, that politics is always downstream from culture. We can't talk about presidential debates and who the next candidate is going to be and call you up to campaign for your local candidate for Congress unless we understand the cultural perspective of what it means to be a conservative and an individual fighting for your rights in the Western world, not just here in America, but across the world. Turning Point USA gets that. It is so exciting to be a part of. And I speak on countless college campuses all over the country every year. I've been to 28 states or so in the last six months. And I can tell you, I'm seeing from the front lines of these college campuses, we are winning. So it's very exciting to be a part of I love of. that. Excellent. So I'm going to just jump into my uh, group questions here, and we're going to pick up on the culture piece, specifically how you're, we're able to target Gen Z. I heard a couple of ways that different folks on this panel kind of got connected. Uh, obviously, the big key is through social media. Um, I heard about from um, Morgan, you're talking about political influencers and people asking about that. So let's talk about, I'd love for each of you maybe to share what are the um, what are the communication tools that are resonating? Like my generation, uh, millennials, we do memes. If you're not familiar with the meme, you've probably seen it. It's a picture 
something interesting maybe from a movie and then an interesting headline. My favorite to send for birthdays in the office is uh, President Trump uh, saying, nobody's going to wish you a better birthday than me. <laughs> I mean, so there, there are comical ways of getting across a message. And I think millennials, we've done that pretty effectively. But what about you guys? And I know, we, um, Garrett, you're a millennial too. You're honorary. Um, we'll accept yeah. you. We'll, 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 we'll pull you in. But what are some of the targeted ways that we can be changing the culture, bringing in that that limited government, uh, individual personal responsibility, limited uh, personal freedom kind of messages, and how, how can we do that? So Morgan, to kick off, and then we'll go down the line. Uh, so I'm a history nerd, and if you couldn't tell by the name of my nonprofit, Young Americans Against Socialism, I have a bone to pick with leftists. And what I find so hopeful about all of this is, yes, the poll says 70% of my generation would vote for a socialist. The good news is, I mean, guys, do we really think 70% of young Americans want to seize the means of production or nationalize industries? No. Have we, can we really be honest? Do you think no. they've even heard that word before? No. The term nationalize? No. Okay, so they're getting fed these incredibly dangerous lies by this very small minority group of radical leftists, the Marxists, the people who understand we want to seize the means of production, end classical liberalism, and end capitalism in America. We need to use Gen Z and millennials as useful idiots, and that's what's happening right now. So you can look at this 70% number and be like, uh-oh, or you can say, wow, this means a lot of people are just being misled and they deserve the truth. So with my nonprofit, there's two pillars that we usually use for communication approaches. There's a study from Michigan State University that said the most effective way to reach a young person with a hard to understand topic or with an opposing viewpoint is actually via peer-to-peer -peer communication, not via parent or professor. And so the concept is called peer rationale. And we take that into not only having people that are younger talk about their experiences under socialism, but also having somebody like me be like, hey guys, here's the five things you need to know about cultural Marxism and what Black Lives Matter is doing to our communities today. And so those are the kind of videos mm -hmm. They don't go as viral, so we have our survivor testimonies, those get millions of views. I don't go around saying, our videos get millions of views, you should donate to us, because you don't know who's really watching those. But what I really love to see is when I post a video, like five, wait, five things you need to know about cultural Marxism, on Instagram, you can see how many people sent that video via direct message to someone else. And to me, that's a very impactful number. So when I see 5,000 people sent that educational information to somebody else in their life, it means that they sent it to them in a DM and said, I want you to watch this. I think this would be a good video for you. It's another approach of peer rationale, a friend saying, I want you to watch this. Uh, that other aspect of firsthand testimony, you guys, the left is so emotional. All they do is bring emotion. They have no facts, no logic. Nothing from history is on their side, and we're still losing the conversation. And it's because people are very emotionally driven. And so having people paint a very vivid picture of the horrors of a nationalized economy is a very, very strong way to help young Americans. Because a lot of us support socialism and communism and leftism in general because we've never lived under it. I will say a very hopeful thing though. I think we have a lot of potential with our generation because guess what we have done now? We have lived with the threat and the impact of leftist ideas because communist China is to blame for everything that's happened for the last two years. So it's not just, oh, we missed our prom, oh, we missed our graduation, oh, we had to wear masks in school, our family members died, our small businesses went down, and we are now living under this authoritarian regime where our youth is being taken from us. Mm -hmm. And I hope we can connect the dots, everyone in this room, to the fact that our youth is struggling right now because authoritarians and socialists and radical leftists view force over choice. We no longer have that choice. So we are living through it. We are experiencing it for the first time. And it's up to us to communicate and connect the dots on that situation to the young people. Great. Garrett. Yeah. Thank you. So something that I do every Thursday is called a Thursday Q&A. And it's where essentially I post up a box, they ask me a question, and I typically guide it towards politics or mental health, because those are two things that I think young people are really struggling with today. And two things I've struggled with in my past too. And I find that being open about that gives encouragement to some young people. But they can submit a question, it's anonymous, I'll repost it. Mm. And I find that the best thing that we can do with explaining our conservative values is explain, not attack, right? The left is known for attacking and for yelling and kicking and screaming. We have to be positive and we have to explain because as soon as we start attacking, as soon as we start doing 
the same thing that they're doing to us as when we're going to chase those people that are on the fence out of conservatism, right? And so that is the most crucial thing that I see is always have, you know, always show your heart, always show who you are, always be positive, but always explain and give them the opportunity to pursue, um, I guess, those beliefs further or not. And so that's something that I really try to do. I get in between 10 to 15,000 views on my Thursday Q and A's. Wow. And I try to choose different people every time. And it's just one of those things where you never really know who you're impacting, but mm -hmm. you're gonna chase those people away the moment you get emotional, just like they get emotional. Mm -hmm. And so I find just be overwhelmingly positive, be understanding, be grateful that they're willing to find out about your beliefs. And maybe you might influence a young man or woman to uh, pursue them. Yeah, and if I could just add something, when we look at, okay, not everybody our age wants to seize the means of production, there's a huge difference between a misguided, young, naive liberal that's being lied to and a radical leftist that wants to seize the means of production. When we, as a group and as a movement, look at those two groups and say, they're all idiots and we need to make fun of all of them and tell them to leave the country in exchange for something else, we're just pushing them away. Mm -hmm. And so we have to understand these misguided young people that maybe do say some dumb stuff, they do not deserve the same communication style as the radical, dangerous idiots on the left. Because those are the flat earthers of economics, I like to call them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they don't. But the young people deserve more attention. Yeah. yeah, and I also hear like, oh, well, we should get a conservative, you know, social media platform. And with me, it's like, I disagree with that. You know, why, why go play in a tub with mm -hmm. people who all have the same beliefs with you? Let's use this opportunity to stick out mm -hmm. in this left-leaning social media platform and see who we can influence with that. And um, Morgan's right, a lot of these kids that I see are simply regurgitating a news headline that they've read. They haven't done any research. So if you present a different idea that makes sense to them in a positive way, you'll be shocked at how many people will think twice about their so-called belief. The truth is most young leftists in America today are being taught that socialism isn't this really horrible political system. It's not where the government's going to take over everything and you'll lose all of your freedom. Socialism is simply a euphemism for compassion and equality today in America. So if you ask a young socialist, why are you a socialist? Why do you identify this way? They say, oh, well, I believe in racial equality and I believe in gender equality and I want everyone to have the same opportunity to have a job and go to school and make money. And they don't realize that every single talking point they share with you is truly a conservative value, that conservatism is the true compassion when it comes to lifting people out of poverty, to giving people more opportunities, to leading to true equality and not equity, which brings that ceiling down rather than the floor up. So when you take the time to have these very important conversations, very, very few young people in America would truly identify as what an actual socialist is. Mm -hmm. Very, very powerful ways to do that are largely through social media and easy conversations and very quick content that doesn't take a long attention span. Many times, I think we've assumed in the conservative movement you have to have a very perfectly scripted lecture and everything has to be beautifully worded and we can't use humor, we can't use laughter, we can't use satire to teach these important lessons to young people in America. How many of you are familiar at all with at least one social media platform? Raise your hand. Most people, I think that's fair to say in 2021, most people have some sort of knowledge of general social media. This is an area of our culture that is constantly evolving. Very frankly, very few people use Facebook today, and yet one in three Americans are active monthly users on TikTok. More than 100 million people in our country open that app regularly on a monthly basis and spend hours scrolling through. I can't tell you how much positive content from the conservative movement I see on TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram. People are becoming incredibly innovative and trying to reach people in new ways that we've never done before, using humor, doing funny dances and making fun of the left, talking about the craziest thing Joe Biden said that day and turning it into a satire video. It is very, very powerful. And what we're seeing now is this opportunity for people to realize that the left is the no fun club in America. I've heard several <laughs> people refer to them as that. That's a good one. But it's one. true. It comes out in their posts on social media. It comes out in their entertainment that they're delivering to us from Hollywood. It comes out from our politicians. Do you honestly see these people smiling and laughing ever? No, they're miserable. They're horrifying to be around. All they do is lament about how evil capitalism is, how evil white 
Christian males are in this country, and it's holding me back, gosh darn it. And so it's always somebody else's fault. They're pointing the finger, they're yelling, they're miserable, and misery loves company. We've seen that with the left. But more importantly, we have an opportunity to teach people that it's okay to laugh. It's okay to have fun. You don't have to take yourself too seriously. We are the party of joy. We're the movement of bringing a smile to someone's face and teaching them reality, because there's nothing more joyful than living in reality than taking ownership of your own life as a young adult and pushing yourself towards achieving your dreams. Social media may seem like a really negative place to do that because all we hear, particularly from traditional media, all day long is censorship, censorship, censorship. Section 230 of the Telecommunications Act is horrible. It is, and it has to go, and that's a conversation we can have for another time. But for the first time in world history ever, almost every single person on Earth has, I don't have mine on me, but a smartphone. We have an opportunity to be journalists ourselves, to tell the truth ourselves, to get the truth out there for other people, which is why you're seeing so many of the people we work with on a daily basis become, and I hate this word, I political too. influencers, <laughs> because their content is changing minds on a daily basis. You're not seeing CNN cover this stuff. To an extent, you're not seeing Fox News cover this stuff, but you are seeing people who are willing to go where the Antifa protests are. They're willing to go interview people who have truly escaped socialism. They're willing to tell these compelling stories, often in a very funny and exciting and entertaining way that's changing minds at a very effective rate. Very good. So I'm going to take a couple of audience questions here. And some of these, um, I hope you guys are taking notes. What they are giving you is what like the millennial consultants or the Gen Z consultants are, are going to charge you a lot of money. <laughs> a lot which of is money. How, I'll tell you for free. Absolutely. Which is actually, I'm taking notes for what I'm going to be implementing when I go home. But um, a question about, uh, and, and there's some questions, how do uh, baby boomers and aging older folks, uh, how are they able to, uh, in, uh, let's see here, influence or elucidate, elucidate Gen Z around these conservative values? So for those of, the, of us in the room who are a little bit older, uh, maybe we're not going to be doing TikTok dances. You could. Um, You're never you, too you old. Could. <laughs> those will go viral. But if that's not your comfort zone, right. you know, what do you recommend? And maybe this is a one question, like what is the one thing that each person in this room can do, whether it's supporting an organization or, how do you, or just connecting with one person, what would you each recommend? Uh, for me, you guys have more power than we do in a lot of ways. Uh, I just ask you to flex your influence a little bit, okay? A good example, uh, I think Olivia's over there. So I have a fun story for you. Uh, I'm not that cool, all right? I'm really, I really, I don't do much. But Olivia had seen me speak at the Texas Youth Summit last year and shortly after I moved to Texas from upstate New York. But I spoke she then, at her school as a freshman, became a student senator in the student government. The student senators were asked to submit a name of a woman that they admired and looked up to. People submitted like pop stars names, Janet Jackson, all these things. Olivia submitted my name. Thank you, Olivia. Um, Uh-oh, that's not good because I, in my DMs, I don't look through my DMs often because it's a lot of people saying like, we're gonna chop your head off with a guillotine. Uh, a lot of Antifa people are in the DMs. Yeah. Yep. So I don't really look at them much, but I see this from this Olivia girl and she says, hi Morgan, um, I'm being threatened to be kicked out of student government because I put your name on a list highlighting women that we look up to. And so I was like, whoa, 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 what's going on? I look and it was this whole social media frenzy at Wichita State University that Olivia had put the name of a capitalist, anti-socialist woman on the, oh my gosh, how dare they? And so they gave her a deadline of 5 p.m. by Friday, 5 p.m., you need to resign from your position because your position, your presence in this room makes us feel unsafe. Because guess what she did, guys? Apparently, she promoted a white supremacist and a Nazi. That's me. Uh, hello. <laughs> so what are you going to do? They gave her by Friday at 5 PM. And so I didn't know what the heck to do. I have influence in many ways, but I didn't know what to do. And so I decided to flex the power that I had. I called my top donors for my nonprofit, my top media connections at Newsmax and Fox and Daily Caller and everything I could do, and all my congressional friends. I mean, I'm lucky now that I have friends of more influence now. And we got in contact with the chief of staff of the school, the school board of trustees. We got in contact with the local state representative. And all of them called that university. And it turns out the university had no idea it was happening, that this girl was being threatened in this way. And so eventually, we got her through the whole process. We defended her. There was like a 10-page paper written on why she was constitutionally OK and sound, and she could put my name out. She's not a Nazi. 
Uh, and we got through it because people helped me by flexing their own power and making simple calls saying, I'm going to pull this funding. I'm going to show up and talk with you about this if you don't stop. So if you're a donor to a university, if you're a donor to an organization, if you are a part of any group, you need to make it very clear you're not going to be a part of this and support the indoctrination on campuses anymore. That's what a lot of you guys can do. OK, please. Thank you. So, and Olivia is here because Steambro brought her, so thank you so much. And thank you, Olivia, for doing that and standing up. I mean, a freshman yeah. stood up against these communists that wanted her gone. Thank you. And this is happening, by the way, this is happening at every university in America. This is not the Berkeleys and Harvards, and no offense to all you Boulder people, the CU Boulders of the world, although I hear Boulder's a lot more conservative than CSU these days, so. Maybe have to change my allegiances that way. So there you go. But this is happening everywhere. This story is from Wichita State University. Just a few weeks ago, BYU Hawaii denied a medical exemption for the COVID-19 vaccine for a young woman who has an autoimmune disease and cannot get any vaccines or she likely will risk death. She had all of her physicians write letters to the university. BYU Hawaii denied her medical exemption and she is no longer attending an LDS school on the island of Hawaii. You're hearing these stories from the University of Kansas, the University of Oklahoma. You're hearing this from the University of Nebraska. This is everywhere. One very shocking one, Liberty University has had two major stories come out this week. First, where they are teaching that Russian interference put a false president into the White House under President Donald Trump in their history and political science classes. This has been revealed this week. And after lying to their students and saying there would be no COVID restrictions on campus, are now mandating a several week quarantine for all of their students at Liberty University. If you are still donating to your alma mater, I respect your intentions for doing so. You loved your college experience. You believed in it. It taught you so much. It gave you a sense of community. But it's time to redirect those donations mm -hmm. because none of these college campuses are educating. They're indoctrinating. It's happening at the uh, local level too, though. It I is, mean, so yeah. good example is my boss has a six-year-old son who has asthma, pretty serious asthma. Well, Homewood School System, which is a suburb of Birmingham, is the most diverse school system in the state of Alabama, um, is mandating masks. And they're also toying with the idea of teaching critical race theory to young kids. And so credit to him, he pulled his son out of school, got his son in a group of like-minded individuals, uh, kids his age, and they all homeschool together. And I find that finding that community for a young person that's in your life is crucial. And whether it's, you know, if they're young enough and you doing it yourself, or you just encouraging them to hop in a community like that is crucial now. This all starts with conversations at home at the end of the day. And it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to memorize a TikTok dance or come up with a very funny meme. I talk a lot about this in my book. And I'll actually be doing a book signing at 1210. If any of you want to stop by, I'd love to meet all of you. Uh, but I have a whole chapter circled around this idea that it's time to start talking about politics and religion, the two topics that have been completely off the table around the dinner table with your kids and your grandkids and the people at home. I was raised by a family who constantly talked about politics and religion. My parents are Roman Catholic attorneys, so we talked about politics and religion all the time at our family dinner table, but from a very young age was encouraged to form my own opinions, to understand what each side of any spectrum of an argument understood and believed in and advocated for, and then go do the research myself and understand what I believed in personally. I was encouraged to do speech and debate by the older people in my life when I was in high school, which taught me so much about research and finding the truth mm -hmm. in a sea of documents where you can't possibly understand what's up and what's down. So the mentorship piece there and understanding that your children and your grandchildren are going to be tasked with carrying this torch forward, not necessarily to run for Congress or become the next president of the United States, but to dictate what culture will be for the United States, which is the last stand on earth. Look at what's happening in Australia and many European countries this week. We have to be the example for what liberty and freedom looks like on an individual basis. And unless we have these conversations now, even when they roll their eyes and say, oh, do we have to talk about politics again, mom? I don't we want to do, do it. it. We have to have these we conversations gotta do now. It. And you all are so much more impactful in that space than any of us could ever be. Thank you so much. So we are going to wrap it up. But just three takeaways that, that these young people just shared with us, things that you can do. Number one, flex your muscles whether that's financially, whether that's with your connections, whenever you hear that a young person is being targeted on campus, use your influence and your power. Number two, mentorship. 
speak it's your kids your grandkids maybe it's the person that's this the student or the young person that's working in your business don't forget senator tim scott it was a chick-fil-a manager that put him on a path to becoming a u.s senator and boy do we have a champion in him mm -hmm. and then number three and garrett talked about this which is finding that community you're in groups there are places where that you where you can leverage your expertise your knowledge just explaining how business works to a young person who doesn't get why fifteen dollars an hour it, it doesn't make sense for why shouldn't we get twenty dollars an hour minimum wage you have power you have resources you have influence and we need your voice in in this fight so thank you so much let's thank our panelists today thank you guys oh thank you everybody thank you.